Thank you very much, Bindu, for making time to come to us. So we invite Dr. Aima now to give us the first option of the talk. So Aima, if you, are, if you can hear me, you can take over now. Yes, I can hear you. Can you hear me? Yes. OK. Hello, everyone, and thank you for inviting me uh, today. Uh, today, I would like to, share, to give uh, more of uh, a general uh, approach for um, the um, most common uh, method or concept we are using in managing or controlling insects, which is Integrated Pest Management, or IPM, an abbreviation. Uh, today, I would like uh, to, to talk a little bit about the uh, concept in general, you know, the big picture how we can approach this concept in our operation and some of the tactics that we are using in IPM to make it like um, our daily uh, concept. So we, we don't wanna like um, see it only as a big uh, theory or like something that we know little about it, but more of the things that we can use uh, on a daily basis. Uh, I have here my contact information as well, my email address and cell phone number. Uh, just in case you would like to uh, ask about anything after the uh, presentation. Um, most of the time I'm experiencing after this specific presentation some question about some of the stuff that we are not covering here, which is like mainly how to identify like insect or identification of specific natural enemies or a specific method of control. Uh, this would be like case by case, and that's when we can, like, uh, the, the uh, personal contact here, uh, we can help with that as well. Uh, so without further, further delay, uh, we would like first to, uh, as I said, um, to deal with the IPM as a concept in general. And just to... Um, we, we are only interested in these organisms when we talk about insect and pest in general, about this uh, organism that can cause uh, economic damage. And this might be a narrow uh, concept and that's driven from uh, like two ways we see how to deal with these pests, control versus management. Um, in control, we would like, or like the, the whole idea is to reduce uh, the number of pests limits that our technology can do. So we just, you know, you know, the old say, there is no good insect, but dead insects. Uh, this is again, this is more of like the old days concept. In management here, we are trying to reduce the impact of this insect or this pest to some level that we can tolerate economically or environmentally or even societally. So the, the, the management here is, is more not even, not like a process of, you know, killing the pest, but more of using information that we can collect and use them to make a good decision uh, on uh, how to reduce the population of uh, pests and reducing their impact uh, as a consequence. There, and then um, we need in this uh, concept or this uh, management approach is to have like mainly three things. First, tolerance, and this is the difference between management and control. And control would like to have insect population reach level of zero, which is like not manageable in many, most of the cases or scenarios. So we need to have some level of tolerance to certain like impact of this pest on our crop or our uh, product. Second thing and the most important, important is information. We would like to have this information in terms of the number of this population and how we can link them to the, uh, the yield or like the quality of the crop or both of them. And finally, we need a strategy. We cannot just go by using whatever available or sometimes not even available, uh, and just try to wipe out the, uh, the, the, the insect or the pest we have. We would like to uh, go with a strategy that can help us and can uh, help us reach our final goal, which is to uh, gain the most economic environment and uh, sometimes societal uh, 
benefit out of this war most of the time between us as human and the pests in general. So in terms of the strategies that we are using all the time, of course, the, the most like known and the, um, the strategies that some of us might um, approach it first is chemical control. And this is, as you see here, I'm giving here number seven because in all of the um, strategies we would like to have chemical uh, as our last resources of management because we have a lot of other strategies of control or management that we can get. We can use nature and our benefits, use them to control uh, uh, insects. We can use biological agents, whether they are uh, uh, other insects, other animals, uh, or like uh, a disease like fungus or bacteria or virus that's specific in terms of infecting uh, insects. Uh, we can use cultural control when we can like modify uh, some of the um, uh, thing around our operation. In insects, there is some legislative and regulatory use as well. There is mechanical and physical uh, management uh, using all of our sources as human uh, in terms of our power or machine power or whatever to manage insects. And we also have genetic, as you know, uh, uh, genetic can uh, help in terms of uh, producing some of these uh, varieties that are resistant to insect and so So I would like just to give, you know, a little bit of concept about some of the methods that we can use a lot, especially if you are operating on a small scale or you want to like operate in term of uh, producing organic or uh, if you have some uh, products that need minimal use of uh, chemical. The first is the cultural control and uh, there is a lot of aspects that we can use and a lot of tactic actually that you can use for the cultural control and how we can uh, uh, how we can like modify our operation around uh, the pests that we have to reduce their impact. First, we need to be wise in terms of choosing the crops and time uh, when we have very few insect pests. So if you have a choice between like sweet corn for fresh market and growing tomato, for example, most of the time sweet corn uh, is easier to grow organically than tomatoes because it had like less uh, pests and their management is, is a little bit easier. Uh, sometimes, not always, but most of the time, let's say, early planting of a crop might have less pressure of pests than planting late. And we have a lot of these uh, concepts here, especially like with corn with some uh, varieties of uh, to mention even like in field crops, like uh, we have a lot of experiences in having this early planting to mitigate this population or escape them uh, as much as we can. Uh, a time of planting or time to planting a, sub a susceptible uh, vegetable crop. So they will be harvested before the agricultural crops uh, in terms of their maturity before the insect began leaving field in search of other hosts. That's here required you to know more about your community, what they are planting. And if I'm having some crops that has, uh, uh, you know, uh, insect pests that will come to my crops that I will plant later, what should I do? Should I go early? Should I go late? Should I wait until this crop in my neighbor's field is, is already mature and then have mine? or I can do uh, in the middle. And this is here required a lot of knowledge about life cycle of insects, as well as uh, knowledge about what your community is planting around uh, your field. Uh, again, like uh, it's, it's quite important, but we need to do a little bit of research because there is a lot of good examples of varieties that have resistant to key pests. And that's in many, uh, crops that we can uh, use and literature are full of this example. So we need to do a little bit homework before we plant any of our crop to see if we have like major pests that can uh, do a lot of damage in our area and if we can find uh, more of a resistant variety uh, for this pest. Crop resistant usually is to use the, you know, uh, the heritable 
plant trade to reduce uh, plant damage resulting from uh, the, uh, the feeding or the insect herbivory. We need to choose, as, as I said, these varieties for our need because sometimes uh, these varieties might not be suitable for our um, uh, geographical area. Sometimes these uh, varieties might have uh, lower yield in our, under our condition and so on. So as I said, we need to do a little bit of homework when we are using resistant varieties. One of the most important tactics that we can use for cultural control is using crop rotation. And this is like quite important because some insect can, you know, uh, have some uh, diapose or hibernation uh, when we can move from one crop to the same crop the following season. And repeating growing the same crop in the same field can result in increasing the pressure of these insects. So it's almost like we are breeding them season after season. And we need to, you know, break this cycle. But we need to think about uh, what and where uh, we are planning or uh, planting our crops in relation to other crops. Because, like I said previously, we have some insects that can, uh, many of the caterpillars that we can find in our field. If we are having the same crop, that would be a problem. We have a uh, even different crop, but they are host to the, to the same insects. That's also a problem. So we need also to know uh, whether these new crops that we are uh, planting in the crop rotation is a host for this insect or not. We need to know whether we have the same problem in terms of what our neighbor are planting, as I said earlier. One of the important also thing about uh, cultural control is uh, like the uh, hygiene and this, uh, like of, of our field. When we are destroying all the crops, the residue of the, all the crops, immediately after we get our harvest, uh, that's quite important managing insect because I mentioned, as I mentioned earlier, some of these insects are uh, uh, like in diapose or hibernation under this so that will help destroying large number of these insects. Some of the immature stages of these uh, of this insect, it will make uh, our um, our uh, bed for the planting is more uh, manageable, and it will control also or help control any other diseases or weeds that might been in the previous crop. So, as I mentioned earlier. And uh, cultural control, when we like destroy the uh, previous yield or the yield from previous season, uh, we will plant into wheat-free fields and that will maintain uh, good wheat control. And this is not only good as wheat control methods, but it also uh, will help with um, having uh, uh, many, much of the organic materials in the soil. It will help control insect uh, like cutworms and fall chinch bugs, some weevils, spider mites, some cricket and slugs that develop into this, weed, into this weed. So it's quite important not only to remove the debris of previous yield, but also to clean your field from weeds that might be host for other, other pests. One of the things that I'm, I'm like, this is advice that I give to many people, is to know when to quit on a crop. Sometimes people are either very much attached to certain crop or they think they are gaining uh, some kind of uh, high profit out of it. But we need to know what is the point when some of these crops became, you know, uh, a field or a ground for one pest or even many pests, and we cannot control these pests before without giving up on uh, this crop for um, you know a season or maybe more. So uh, depending on the overall situation, it might be like worse to grow some other crops uh, and see if we can like get this insect pressure uh, change. And remember also, as I said. Uh, earlier to uh, destroy the uh, residue of this crop. 
One of the things, or the message that's quite important and quite, you know, effective actually in terms of cultural uh, control is using trap crops, when, when, when visible, of course. Uh, uh, trap crops is crops that planted to attract pests away from the main crop. Like uh, one, one of the big example, and when we have some bees around tomatoes, um, because there are a lot of like uh, common insect pests between the two crops. Uh, again, you have to be smart, of course, you have to be able to kill the pests that are attracted to the uh, trap crop before they would be able to move to the main crop. So one of the methods that uh, we are using all the time is we call it attract and kill. So we can like use these uh, trap crops to attract the pest and then uh, by some methods of control uh, that we most of the time we don't want to use it on the main crop, let's say chemical control, but we can use it in the trap crop to kill uh, the population of this insect and let the main crop escape uh, from their impact and damage. We, this is um, this method I said is, is effective, but we need to understand the biology of insect pests and infesting your crops. Which is which is stage that can move, so we can make the control be, before the insect population reaches this stage. Uh, what time that this insect might arrive, so we don't plant the crop before they arrive, otherwise they will go to the main crop and so on. So there is here. Uh, good knowledge of the biology of the insect pests and their cycle and the relationship with trap crop and main crop is quite important here. Sometimes you can use like some of the um, other methods that can uh, cover or like uh, the, the, the soil and sometimes can warm them up like using uh, some metallized reflective plastic mulch. Uh, that can be used infestation of some pests, especially when the plant is still small and uh, they cannot like tolerate a high infestation of some insect like uh, increase the, uh, the the reflection can prevent the insect from recognizing the seedling of the plant early on and here we are playing with the physical uh, clues that the insect can use to land on this small plant and prevent this insect from recognizing the plant here. Uh, and in, in many cases, it can uh, reduce the incidence of serious insect, especially the insect that carry some uh, diseases. Uh, sometimes this reflective uh, mulch uh, can be more effective uh, than even like using chemical spray, because uh, as I said, it plays against the uh, the clues that the insect can use to recognize the plant or their host. It can warm up the, uh, the soil, so if there is any stages of the insect in the soil, it can, you know, help kill them, and uh, it prevents a lot of this insect from coming to uh, your field. Uh, another method of, our, 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 of control is mechanical control, and here we, we, we can use, like, uh, machine power or human power, uh, to control some uh, insect when that is visible. Uh, there is a lot of example in organic uh, uh, growing uh, facilities of using uh, some uh, uh, specialty design uh, to blow or to remove some insect from plant. And that's quite uh, good and play, uh, quite well and some insect like if it's sometimes white flies uh, and insect of this nature. Sometimes, and this is very well known uh, method, we can use like forceful spray of water uh, to dislodge like some insect like aphid from, uh, from the plant, especially when we don't have high population. And we can do that quite effectively. Uh, if possible, we can uh, hand pick some insects uh, and their egg mass. Um, although it's quite um, like a labor intensive, but uh, you can use some other, you know, it's not exactly a machine, but many times, especially if you are in an area that infested with a grasshopper, uh, most of the time you can um, uh, get some chicken and just let, leave them in the field and they will pick the eggs and they will like be very helpful in terms of managing and controlling 
some insect like grasshopper or cricket or locust. Or we can like, again, use a machine or use our hand to remove weeds. And that's playing uh, to the earlier method we use that we need to plant into a weed-free uh, area that doesn't have much of uh, plant residue here. Uh, another method that we are using uh, uh, is uh, what we call mating disru disruption. And here we are, uh, we, we would like to um, break the cycle of, or, or, or the reproduction cycle of uh, some insects. Uh, and most of the time we are using some of the um, uh, pheromones that is, you know, a, a way, a chemical language between male and female to, uh, to break this cycle like by confusing uh, uh, male mass uh, 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 by having some of this uh, pheromone in the trap. So the male will think this trap is female and will go there. And if there is a sticky material in this trap, they will stuck there and they will not be able to mate. And then they will not have offspring. So the, the, the female here will lay egg, but this egg is unfertilized and we will not have uh, much of this uh, larva that can feed uh, on our crops. So this, and this for a moment we should know, this is very specific and they are not available for uh, every insect test. This is a lot of research behind these hormones and uh, we have them for a uh, uh, number of insects, not all of, uh, nor, not all of the insects. Uh, again, I can mention here also there is some what we call aggregation hormone. This is hormone that some insect, especially vehicles and some uh, moths are using to aggregate on a source of food. If, if the, one, of the, uh, one individual of this insect find a good source of food, they will uh, just release this pheromone. And here we can use this pheromone and if we use this in a sticky trap, uh, it will work as the uh, uh, like a sex pheromone as well. Uh, then we can like, move to a, a really very important big topic about uh, uh, control of insects here or biological control. This is uh, a method that's um, quite effective, used, used it since the, um, the dawn of history. Uh, and this is biological control, which is like using a naturally occurring biological control agent. Um, control, uh, insect. This is one of the most important method especially like an organic operation uh, and area that uh, it will need uh, more diversity in, ter in terms of the plant. Uh, if we have like area with a lot of blooms that would promote a lot of the bene uh, beneficial insect because many uh, of them are depending on uh, feeding on nectar, especially as adults. Uh, some of us can buy and release some beneficial insect into like the um, uh, in our field, and that can work quite well. Uh, it can work very good in like a um, uh, closed uh, environment like greenhouse, uh, but it can work with certain uh, species in outdoor uh, fields, but you need to know exactly which, uh, again, pest you have and which is the best natural enemy that you can use uh, in this, uh, on this uh, pest. So uh, biological control usually is uh, when like happen or we are promoting them and using them when the pests are not native to the area. So we need to locate the native homeland of this pest and try to find their natural enemies. And then uh, we do some evaluation of the, all, on the suitability of this natural enemy and whether it will be good fit to the environment where these insects are, or new insect testing. Then we can like rear this natural enemy agent and release them and redistribute, and we can re-release them uh, later on based on how they can establish in the area. We have a lot of like insects uh, that are quite good in terms of managing 
uh, manifest in Arizona. All of these instincts here are in them locally. They are morally, uh, like, more or less, um, majority of them are predator, which is like they feed directly on uh, a different stage, or they, some of them are parasitoids, which means that they are parasite on some of the insects, like the, um, the picture here in the middle here. This is one of the parasitoids insert their uh, ovipositor or like egg laying machine inside a larva and inside the body of this larva they will deposit the eggs and this egg will hatch to be a larva of the parasitoids that will feed on the larva of the host until they complete their life cycle. So this is mostly like some of these natural enemies that you can find uh, here in Arizona in different crops. It's quite important to know them because at the end of the day, they are insects, right? They are just looks like other insects. So if you don't, or if you confuse uh, between them and like the pest, you might kill them, uh, assuming that they are bad people here, or bad guys here, but these are good guys. In, in, in many fields, like in Arizona here, I'm giving just like an example. There is like a food web of all of these, uh, uh, predators and parasitoids have a crop and you have one pest or more, you might find, you know, many of the natural enemies are in the environment. All of them, we hope that they are eating the insect pest, but even like sometimes if you cannot find much of the pest, they can each eat, eat each other. And here like, you know, size matter and the bigger might eat the smaller and so on. But once you have the pest, they can like go after it and they are eating it. So this is here just you know some examples here of this insect. I hope you can recognize uh, some of them. Like uh, on the top right here, we have this is crab spider. So like really good in many environment, many crops here in Arizona. Here, this is a lace wing larva. It's like good predator, very active and managing a lot of insects. This is big eyes bugs or Eucharist species because you have these two big eyes here. And it's very good in managing white flies and aphid. Collapse beetle, this is, they call it also like the uh, soft wing rose beetle because their wings are not as hard as many other beetles that we know. It's good in managing a good array of insects, quite active in uh, finding their prey. Down here we have uh, orus uh, bugs or uh, mini pirate bugs. It's very tiny, sometimes you cannot see it, but they are quite active in feeding and sucking the whole body of white flies and aphids and other soft-bodied insects. And here we have Drabetes flies, and this is very good in controlling uh, white flies. Adult. I don't know if you can see it, but it's like a shadow here in this area. This is actually a white fly that this insect is capturing, but by its mouth and starts sucking on them. It's, it's quite important to know, like, despite what we are doing, including like chemical control, the most important part in managing uh, insect population is biological control, especially predation and parasitism. So this is here an example, and I want to like give it because this is an example from cotton. And we know cotton is like, we use a lot of chemical in it, insecticide uh, to manage insects. But look at uh, how much of, uh, this is here like, of one, so this is, could be, if you uh, multiply it by like uh, uh, 100, it would be like the percentage. See how much predation and parasitism, which is like the main of the biological control methods here, the, the, the yellow one and the red one, are responsible for, for the mortality of all pests in cotton system in Arizona. It's like close to maybe 40%. This lodging, which is like because you are driving a tractor there or are like wind or anything like that is responsible for about 10%. And the rest of it, it just, you know, tiny fraction, including even chemicals. So even like in a very heavy system where we are using a lot of chemicals, still like biological control agents are the major part in managing the system as whole. Uh, uh, so this is just to, you know, let us reflect on how nature can help us if we can help nature as well. So, as I said from the beginning, we need to 
take care of these natural enemies, we need to conserve them. First, we need to know them, right? Identification is key. Uh, we need to know their behavior and their biology so we can like uh, uh, help them uh, and uh, the rules. Uh, we need to practice uh, conserve these natural enemies. So as I said from the beginning, sometimes uh, just leaving some plants that has some blooms or some flowers. This nectar is quite important to natural enemies. Diversification is quite important for natural enemies. Uh, not using a uh, uh, broad spectrum insecticide is quite important for reserving uh, natural enemies. And we need to justify the management decision. We cannot like go and say, oh, I found some pest or some insect pest. I'm, I need to just kill them and I will use uh, insecticide or synthetic insecticide. We need to have what I call all the time action threshold, which is here's a number of these insect pests and whether they will make some damage to the crop and whether I will be able to tolerate this damage. If not, yeah, I could have some justification. But I need also to count the number of natural enemies that I have and to see if they can be able to manage this insect on their own. We need to, if we have, like I said, the last resources to use uh, insecticide, we need to use what we call selective insecticide, especially stage one, which is like quite selective in terms of they are going behind insect, the pest itself, but they have minimal or no impact on the pollinator, the natural enemies, and the environment. And that's like, they are available right now. We have a lot of chemicals like that if we need use chemical insecticide. So uh, the methods that we are mentioning a lot is like uh, in control is using uh, chemical insecticide, uh, which is like the that we are using. It, this is like a material that we can use to kill, attract, repeal, or regulate the pest. And there's a lot, you know, of sites here, like from fungicide, herbicide, insecticide, and so on. They're effective, I should say are fast and easy. You can, you can just, you know, grab your sprayer or like mount your sprayer on your tractor and spray the insecticide and they cut fast. They can cut down the uh, insect population uh, quite fast. Uh, we need to know that their mode of action is quite different in terms of how they work. Some of them are systemic, which means this, the pesticides are absorbed through the tissues of the plant and they are transported uh, 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 everywhere, uh, especially where the insect can encounter and feeding on the plant. There is contact pesticide, and this must become in direct contact with the pesticide. It will not be effective at all. Pesticide or insecticide also vary by selectivity. As I mentioned earlier, uh, some of them are selective. And uh, uh, which means that they are uh, good in terms of like uh, their impact on the pest, but not on natural enemies and pollinator. But some of them are not selective, so you can get everything, including not only the pest, but some other, um, uh, some other uh, natural enemies and pollinator, and some of the other that we need to keep. Pest side are varied by uh, resistance. Uh, some of them have the residual, so they are remain active for like weeks, months, some even like years. Uh, some of them has no residual, so they can just be there and for short time. As we know, like we, we for for many many years, especially like since World War II until like maybe like uh, 60s or 70s, we we have what we call the chemical. Uh, era in terms of pest control, a very big example of it of DDT that we can use in everything, plant, the human, animal. And it was like, I discovered it one more bill. Uh, but the, the, the control pesticide have this trade off. Yeah, they can, you know, in terms of like the, the impact of some pest on human life or like animal life, yeah, they can save life. Uh, and they can increase the food supplies. They are, they are quite profitable if you like apply some insecticide and you are like, spend like $10 per acre and then your return on investment is 20. You are like making 100% here. You work fast, as I said. Uh, many of them, let's say, especially selective one, 
they might be safe if used improperly. The, the disadvantage here is that with chemical insecticide come resistance and resistance is genetic. So they will like be inherited generation after generation of this insect and some of this insect can produce generation in a week like aphid and white fly. As I said, some of the broad spectrum insecticide can kill natural enemies, not only the pest, uh, and they can pollute the environment, and they can like harm people, health, and wildlife, and so on. And for many like operation, especially like small and beginning farmers, they are quite expensive. So there is what we call like since you know uh, almost the mid of is what we call the email. We spray and kill. The pest and natural enemies with, with broad spectrum insects. All of these insects are resistant. They breed and they will come back and we repeat until we have resistance uh, for the primary uh, pest that we have. We, we increase the rate of application. Let's say if we are applying, you know, one ounce per acre, we're applying two, four, eight, and so on. So we are killing more insects. So some of the secondary pests that we never know about it. They have outbreak and they will come and we have resistance even for the secondary pest and then we change chemical and we might have another resistance and the, we repeat this uh, uh, sequence here uh, as we call it like the pesticide treatment. Um, the, the purpose of, of like the IPM came you know with the beginning uh, of under our understanding of what uh, insecticide or pesticide are doing. These are like the, uh, what we call like the uh, founding father of pest management concept back in uh, They form it or like the, the um, uh, invented the, the, uh, the, uh, the expression, the IPM. And they, they were looking and at the beginning, they were looking for agriculture as part of the larger ecosystem. It's not only like your field or even your neighborhood or your community about ecosystem. Uh, they, they, they said that we have to, you know, count the, the number of insects and we have to uh, justify based on this number and the impact on the yield or the quality. Whether we need any kind of control or not. And if this control is a chemical, we need to make sure that we are promoting beneficial insects them and we need uh, to uh, minimize the impact of any uh, methods of control on the natural enemies. So if you try to find a definition for IPM and you google this term, you will find a lot of definition. So I like this one here, I will just let you to read, to read it, but what I like about it is just some key word here. This is integrated pest management. So here we are not using only one method or one approach of management, but we are, you know, bringing different methods in harmony to manage the insects that we have. Uh, the other thing is that this IPM is a sustainable science-based decision-making, sustainable. So we are linking here IPM to uh, the big, you know, theory of sustainability here, and it's important. And, uh, making our resources available, not only for our generation or ours only, but for generations to come. Uh, from the beginning, I told you the management itself is uh, a process based on information. Information would help in making uh, a decision in terms of what we can do and what we cannot do uh, for this management. And it's also like a reduce risk uh, approach or strategy. So here we would like to know what the methods that we have uh, or can use, whether they would be like having impact on human uh, health or like uh, animal health or the whole environment and how we can reduce this. Uh, this. Uh, COVID-19 uh, has this also definition. It's not big different from the previous one, but here he um, put in words that uh, we would like to see uh, like interest of all the parties that can benefit from IPM, which is like producer, like the grower society, all the community that we are serving and living in, and the environment itself. 
So we have like, you know, with, with the progress and development of IBM, we have different approaches to IBM. You know, the very basic level when we have like single uh, field, when we have some tests and we are trying to deal with them. And we can like use mostly like single approaches here. Second level when we have some interaction here, uh, we would like not only to, um, you know, look at one test, but how it will be impacted with others, not only in one field, but in the whole community's field. The third level, and this is a level that we are all trying to strive for each is as an ecosystem, how we can approach this um, uh, IPM in term of uh, ecosystem and try to uh, approach that by having more information and make this information available among different use of uh, these IPM technologies. And there is a lot of factors that impact all of this, like socioeconomic uh, forces, environmental concern, regulatory uh, and government policy. As I mentioned earlier, uh, if, if we look at like uh, the big um, picture of where pest management can fit, we can go back to the sustainability. And we can go back to where we can find this pest in terms of sustainable approach for managing the whole ecosystem, as I said, which is like a big, uh, a big goal. Here you can find here the pest here. It's one of the, uh, um, let's say the factor or like one of the um, main uh, uh, or main uh, uh, concepts here of approaching sustainability in the whole. So going back to our strategies here, we are not using only one. If we are using one, that's mean our system is not because if this one method or one approach is, is, is failed, we are in big trouble. So we need to figure out how we can use different methods uh, or different strategies in harmony, as I said before. So we can approach integration of control methods. So uh, one of the things that I'm promoting all the time is that, yeah, we can like all the time say, you know, if we fail for all of other approach, we can depend on chemical for some times, but we have problems here. This is from like the uh, uh, federal IPM roadmap. We have we have a lot of problem in terms of resistance to and even some other method like genetic and so. On. So there is a lot of uh, also of restrict cancel label of some insects. Plus, there is a pressure from, you know, the, the stakeholder. We have, uh, like, the env environmental concern of impact of insecticides. Some consumers need more organic and more uh, pesticide-free product. And the public opinion are shifting. So uh, all of that, even if you think we have um, a lost resource, is not always available. Adding to that, this is here. Uh, the, uh, the numbers uh, of how much it would cost to develop a, a crop protection product. Quote Back in 1995, you can uh, the average was about 100, 152 million dollars. Going all the way now to uh, the last uh, numbers here we can get was in 2014, and it reached uh, like 286 million dollars, almost double. And if you look now, with all of the change in regulation and restriction, this number could approach half a billion dollars for only one product. This money is not coming from, you know, any public money or taxpayer money, but this is mostly uh, private companies. They have, you know, uh, stakeholders and so on, and they need profit. So uh, you would imagine how, how much the cost of this product would be at the end if they can get out to the market because if you look at this other uh, graph here, uh, the the yellow uh, bars here represent the uh, any new lead in terms of chemicals. If we have some chemicals that they are uh, having um, are having them, and the black one 
is how many of these leads launch it into the market. You see like in the 90s, yeah, we have like very close, almost like a lot of these leads ended up in the market. But if you look at the 2000, we have very few of them. So you can like even spend a lot on some of these products, but they will never see any profit. So we have problem even with chemical uh, approaches here. So we'd like to shift the IPM continuum from being chemically reliant to more of biologically reliant here. We mentioned in our talk before. It's also important because uh, to use you know different methods to help with uh, the, the, the ecosystem itself, especially the system, uh, especially the diversification. If we have habitat diversification, and uh, that will like help with the organic matter and minimal uh, uh, tillage and minimal disturbation, that will increase natural enemies and that will help with lowering the pest population. If we go other way, we have like monoculture, we have a lot of chemical use and a lot of uh, disruption uh, to the soil, a lot of pesticide, we will end up in decreasing natural enemies and that will uh, increase the population of uh, pest and to be out of control. So we need integration even among its discipline because entomologists or agronomist, or even like soil scientist, will not do that. We need all of us coming together to help uh, this cause. I will just leave. Uh, I will just leave you with this uh, chart here about the whole system and the like uh, best suppression strategy. Uh, the lists that I have here are more um, uh, descriptive. They are not uh, prescriptive. Uh, it does not consider what is the uh, least and farmer can do and achieve effective and sick pest suppression. Uh, all of the tools and strategies will cost time, will cost money, and will cost effort. So uh, we need to, um, we know the actual value and whether one of these methods or more can be used in our operation or not. So uh, these strategies uh, are very difficult to uh, test um, in a very uh, good way. So you need to have some good information about them uh, beforehand and you need to do your homework to know whether they will be good for your uh, operation or not. So stuff like soil building, habitat building and pest management tools, they can work all together hand in hand to, uh, to help the, uh, the whole system. Um, as I said, like this is uh, approaches of like the soil building here in some operation. In many of the operation here, you have increase in the organic matter, which is like the green bar, except one, uh, one case. And when we have this increase in the soil building, we have decrease in the insect population. Uh, again, like the uh, habitat building and diversification in some of these um, uh, in our operation, when we have more uh, crops, it will help a lot in pest suppression. And when we have uh, reduced tillage, as you can see here, uh, comparing the pink uh, line here, which is like conventional tillage, one which is like the no tillage, we have higher population of some of the natural enemies here, uh, especially carabid beetle uh, and roof beetle. This is quite good in terms of uh, these two beetles are good in managing many caterpillars that attack corn. Uh, as I said, uh, crop rotation is quite important. When we have like monocrop, we will have poor uh, pest suppression. When you start getting some kind of rotation, you might get, you know, so-and-so kind of uh, pest suppression compared to the very good uh, uh, control and pest suppression when you have uh, rotation and change your crops from one cycle after the other. IPM is like uh, like a pyramid. You need to know at the beginning what's your insect, which is like if you have use for some chemical, it has to be selective. And avoidance is the base of it because it has all of the other biological things that you would know about your insect from my uh, control them with other we have our base is quite narrow, the 
this is quite not what happened to, what happened to these pyramids collapse so we need to build on all of the biological cultural and all of the aspects to keep our environment safe and sustainable so as i said like ipm is something that's good for farmer because it can reduce costs and protect for environmental structure for even people are registering uh, some of chemicals especially if it's like organic uh, chemicals for regulator for scientists, they can integrate new knowledge and increase our understanding or test. And for politicians, because for them, it's like almost no one can oppose. And with that, I would like to thank you. I'm sorry if I extended my time here. And uh, back to you, Isaac. Thank you very much, Simon. That was very impressive. Though we went ahead uh, over our time. I think you all agree that uh, it was worth it to have it to have him extend at the time. So, if there is any question now, uh, the floor is open solely for a minute or two, or one or two questions, if there are any, before we end the meeting here. At the same time, I'm going to line the poll whilst we wait for any question, if there is any. So, just go ahead and fill out the poll. Uh, there are about just four questions that you need to fill out. So based on the presentations that we had today. Any questions? Ayman, I want to ask just one question if there is no question to be asked. Okay. So how do we, we want to increase carbon in the soil by using crop cover, no till and stuff. How do we manage that threshold so that we don't get the, the insect pest being hosted in the debris that we have in the previous years? How do we get in between that? So is the question if you would like to increase the organic matter in the soil with cover crops or? Yeah, with cover crops and then no-till. And no tail. Yeah. It's, it's manageable, but for cover crops, especially, you need to know when you terminate the crop so it can give you as much of the organic uh, material, organic matter as, as, you, as you want. Because sometimes we can use uh, cover crops, but we can leave it until maybe it's mature. And at the end, when we incorporate it in the soil, we don't have as much, or it will not produce as much organic uh, matter if we can, like, for example, uh, harvest it a little bit earlier. So that's one thing. The other thing that we would like, uh, or, or I would like to add in terms of disturbing the soil. Now we can, like, just leave the organic, uh, or uh, like, residual on the top, and some other times we would like to incorporate this organic material to you know the first six ten inches of the soil which is like the area that where most of the uh, uh, nutrition are coming from we we have some debate about that personally i would like to get this uh, uh, organic residual in the soil as soon as possible especially in our environment here in arizona um, and especially for summer cover crops, because if we leave them up, up in, the, in the soil, uh, most of the time you will not get as much uh, of, their, uh, of them in terms of uh, organic matter as if you incorporate them in the first like few inches of the soil to help protect them from environment uh, factors and to help promote these organic materials in the soil. Okay. Thank you very much. Is there any other question or uh, that need to be attended to? Ayman, thank you very much for that response. I really appreciate it. Thank you. Yeah.